On today's show, Jabari Smith Jr. with the best game of his NBA career, hitting the game-tying three-pointer to send Rockets Pacers into overtime. Plus, what went wrong in the overtime period for the Houston Rockets? Why did Jalen Green struggle so much early on against Miles Turner and the Pacers defense? How did he find his way back as the game went along? All of that and more coming up right here at Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. The Houston Rockets select... Jalen Green, Alperon Shengun, and Jabari Smith Jr. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. Every time I step on that floor, I'm coming. Hey, Houston fans, I am so happy. You're getting somebody who's going to come in with a chip on their shoulder, somebody who's going to come, come in and compete from day one. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian, a credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin. And the show, of course, at Locked on Rockets, free and available wherever you listen to your podcasts, including YouTube. Just go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets, like, comment, subscribe. Tell me your thoughts on Jabari Smith Jr.'s best game of his NBA career, the insane game time tying three-pointer. I want to know what you feel about all of that. Let me know in the YouTube comments. Now, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook partner of Locked On. Make every moment more with FanDuel. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. And as always, thank you so much for making Locked On Rockets part of your day every single day, whether it's on the way to work, on your lunch break, in the gym. Thank you for making LOR part of your day every single day. Joining us now is Madison Moore. You can follow on Twitter at Madman Leaks to discuss and break down the Rockets 134 125 overtime loss in Indiana against the Pacers. And man, this was, Madison, this was the definitive Jabari Smith Jr. game. This it, it has been. A long time coming. We finally got one. There's been a few games before this one where you thought you got a kind of a glimpse at what Jabari could be. This is bar none. The best game of his career to date. Hit the game tying shot with seconds left on the clock. Final offensive possession of the game for the Rockets. A turnaround fadeaway three-pointer to tie the game up at 115 to send it to overtime giving him his career high 30 points in this game. He finished the night his stat line was was absurd. 30 points, 10 of 19 shooting, was 3 of 5 from long distance, 7 of 9 at the charity stripe, had 12 rebounds, 3 of them offensive, 3 assists, 2 steals and a block in his 47 minutes of run. I was so thoroughly impressed with Jabari's game in this one. We're going to unpack what, you know, kind of what really stood out and how I think how I think he was able to be effective in this one. What did you see for out of Jabari in this game, Madison? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I know this is really simple, but I feel like Jabari starting inside the perimeter, one of the things that um, Frank has talked about in some of his videos about getting good looks inside the perimeter from elbow in, right? And those type of looks, I think he got some really high percentage looks in those areas. He was able to knock them down early, and you can see his confidence and rhythm start to kind of awaken his skills, right? And once that began, once that began, he got in rhythm. He hit his first couple shots. He hit his first three, and then you could tell it was kind of curtains. And it was beautiful to see because, you know, this is the that Jabari was to see. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to no, yeah, yeah. no, really. But you, it was great to see because we finally got to see one of those high level flashes from Jabari Smith of what the future of a player like this with his skill set will look like on our team, right? I mean, we don't expect Jabari to be, you know, uh, you know, a, a great from the Arcus rookie year. You know, we don't expect him to make all his shots, but it's good to see. Um, you, it's good to see when they flash, right? When our young guys flash, and we can see the future of who they are, who they will be in a more consistent level when they get the reps, when they when they get stronger, when they become the guys who they're meant to be, right? We get to, and I think this was just a great preview into who Jabari Smith will become, and I like that 
although Jabari was making his shots from the uh, from the perimeter and the elbow in jump shots, he still retained his attacking ability, ability to attack that he's really leaned on while he while he wasn't shooting well. Really taking it off, taking the guys off the dribble. He had an excellent drive on uh, Miles Turner, who was an absolute terror for all of the Rockets players, especially Jalen Green, where he just took it to, to his chest and finished uh, finished over him. I, I mean, just him putting together such a complete package of offensive game tonight was really, really encouraging to see. He's been building on this in the past couple games, and hopefully he can continue to build on it in the last, you know, the, the next 14, 15 games we have left. I was really encouraged from the offensive package, and you can see his game growing within that. And honestly, I just think it's about reps. Once he gets reps and comfortable and gets into, into more rhythm, we'll begin to see more games like this. Absolutely. It was it was very much you could see he got into rhythm early, right? Because he got back to some of those bread and butter spots that were so important to him in college, right? Shots at the elbow shots where he was posting up and getting to that little turnaround fadeaway that he, you know, thrived and lived off of at Auburn. And so you got those kind of rhythm shots and not to say that he isn't that he can't be a good three-point shooter, but when you're in rhythm, when you're in the flow of the game, when the, you got the juices going, all of that, it's a lot easier to hit some rhythm three-pointers out of that, which is why he was able to shoot 60% from, from downtown in this one, right? He was two of four, and then he hit the really big one, the game-tying three at the end of regulation. So for Jabari, getting some of those comfort spots, right? I, I really think that the Rockets need to lean into and tap into this version of him moving forward. You can't just sit him on the three-point line and expect him to be a dead-eye knockdown three-point shooter when he's not warmed up, when he's not loose, when he's not involved offensively. And this was that that glimpse of like, okay, please tap into this over the last 10, 15 games or so so you can feel really confident about Jabari going forward. Now, I will say that despite he had this incredible offensive game, really doing a great job getting to the free throw line, right? Absor you know, driving, absorbing contact. He had a bunch of plays where he just tucked his head down and went barreling at the rim and for better or for worse and drew fouls that way, got to the free throw line, got some easy points there, seven of nine shooting again. Defensively, there were some, I, I had some frustrations with him though. You know, I, I do want to give him his flowers. I think especially early on, the entirety of the Rockets team really struggled, especially there in the first quarter with the Pacers were just on fire from long distance. They shot six of 10 from three in that first quarter. Rockets were abysmal at closing out on shooters. Jabari was one of those guys who lost his man like, Within the first half, I think Jabari lost his man like four or five different times to give up wide open three pointers. And that's just something that kind of can't happen. But he did, I think, I think he got better as the course of the game went along, locked in a little bit more. He had what was maybe arguably a foul on the final play of regulation where he went up and contested the drive by Tyrese Halliburton. You know, there was some contact there, but ultimately no call. Overtime happens, uh, and we we will talk about the defensive breakdowns uh, in overtime by this Houston Rockets team. It was it was rough sliding for them in the overtime period. We'll also talk about the general flow of the game coming up here in just a moment. Why the Rockets struggled so much out of the gate in this one. Jalen Green struggling early in this game, but kind of finding himself along the way, which is another encouraging sign. We're gonna get there in just one moment. But first, today's episode is brought to you by Better Help. Look, getting to know yourself can be a lifelong process, especially because we are constantly growing and changing. Therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding because sometimes we don't know what we want, right? Life doesn't come with like a user manual to break down exactly what to do, when to do it, all that. It'd be nice if it did, but it doesn't. Uh, or sometimes why we react to things the way that we do, and we talk through these things. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, if it wasn't readily apparent in that first segment, we forgot to actually, you know, anoint him officially. But Jabari Smith Jr. is definitely your Locked on Rockets player of the game from this one. I haven't given out a Locked on Rockets player of the game award in a minute. 
because there have been some really frustrating games as of late. And so it just kind of got, it got to be a thing where I just kind of like, I shelved the award for a few games and put it on the shelf and it's just been collecting cobwebs and dust. So we'll take a Swiffer to it, get it, you know, all polished and cleaned up and hand it to Jabari because he absolutely deserves it for his play in this game. But Madison, Rockets out the gate did not look great early on. They struggled defensively. The whole team struggled, right? Miles Turner was getting whatever he wanted against Alper and Shingun, and then it wasn't only Alpi. He was getting whatever he wanted later in the game against Garuba. He was getting whatever he wanted on, on Jay Sean Tate on switches. He was getting whatever he wanted against Jabari as the five. Like, it, Miles Turner was a problem in this game for the Rockets. He went off for 21 points on 8 of 15 shooting. Thankfully, later in the game, he did foul out, so he wasn't, you know, as much of an issue later on in this one. But I really think that, you know, we talked about briefly there for a moment, them losing the three-point shooters. Indiana kind of came back down to earth a little bit, though, as far as the three-point shooting goes. They were on fire there in the first quarter. They kind of regressed going into halftime because at one point... I think at halftime they were 8 of 22 or so. So I think they were like 2 of 12 in that second quarter after going 6 for 10 in the first frame. So they did kind of regress back to the mean a little bit. It was crazy, though, watching Tyrese Halliburton, who didn't hit a single three-pointer through all of regulation, was 0 of 7 from threes in regulation. You knew he was too good of a three-point shooter to not eventually hit one. And not only did he hit one, he hit two in overtime as the Pacers were creating that separation and kind of, I mean, there were so, Madison, there were so many defensive breakdowns in the overtime period after what was such an encouraging battle back to the mountaintop for the Rockets to tie this thing up and even force the overtime to begin with. Yeah, so, okay. So, honestly, rotations have been improving since the first half. The first half, our rotations were really bad. It was hard for us to get out to shooters, but we were trying and help side was there, right? That we were just being kind of outplayed with uh, with the Pacers' uh, superior ball movement, right? But as the game got on uh, until we got into the fourth quarter, we began to see the Rockets settle down. Tate started to do an incredible job on um, um, Miles Turner uh, in the paint. He started to, you, right? And guys kind of start to understand what exactly the Pacers were doing, and they were playing it to the T, and they were making it gritty and ugly, and, and they were grinding them out, right? It was, it was very encouraging to see, right? And then we get to overtime. And honestly, there were breakdowns, multiple breakdowns on several different levels. There was one play where Tyrese Halliburton had a wide open lane to, to the rim, and I watched this play over and over again. And what happened was is Tyrese Halliburton is being guarded by K.J. Martin, right? And Jabari Smith is on the screener, um, who I believe is Smith, uh, uh, Jalen Smith, right? What Tyrese Halliburton does is he rejects the screen, right? And this – K.J. Martin is so unprepared for this rejection that he's completely out of the play once the right the, – it was a right-to-left crossover. He's completely out of the play. So there's no resistance from his primary guy as if, you know, there was nobody there at all because that's how bad he's beat on this play. Jabari Smith's out of the play because he was going to – he's up high because he's, he's ready to switch, switch on the Halliburton. So he's completely out of the play because he rejected the screen. Right. And then that switches the coverages for our, our down guards, who is Dacia Nix and Jalen Green, who are supposed to be help defenders in this situation. But since the screen has been rejected, Jalen, if he took the screen, Jalen would have been the strong side helper. Right. Right. But since he rejected it, it switches Jalen to the weak side helper, which means he needs to be further down into the paint. Right. And Dacia Nix just acts like he doesn't see anything happening when it happens all in front of his face and he doesn't even move. And so neither one of them come to help in the paint, right? To, to and it's just it's just terrible. You but you get to see a young team um when things happen so quickly and how they're not able to process it fast enough, right? It's you know, young team errors. And as great as a game as Jabari Smith had offensively, he was really bad defensively in this game. Uh, you know. A, a lot of the time he had his flashes. He had some moments, but consistently he was bad on rotations. 
He really has to work on his closeouts. He's probably one of the worst closeout guys right now on the team. Um, he doesn't break down well enough. The, the he's whole not and the, the, it's it's such a pet peeve of mine. The whole team really struggles when it comes to closing out because yeah. they just have they're not disciplined on closeouts, right? Like they, you'll get guys who either it's a half ass closeout where you're kind of you're lunging at the guy and, and you're not even in a defensive stance, which is kind of one of my biggest gripes with Jabari is he'll go to closeout and he's not like down like trying to you know. Make yourself make yourself big. Cut off driving lanes, right? Make a guy get around you. He's just kind of running at the guy. Um, and then they had this tendency in this game specifically. I don't know how many times Rockets, you know, would send somebody to close out, and they they had the right idea, right? You want to run these guys off the three point line, but you're going like flying yeah. by this guy, and then all like I don't know how many times Buddy Heel just took a quick like reset dribble and pulled up a three because he knew the defender was just going to go flying by him ninety miles an hour and not even be in the picture if he just waited a half second. So you got to yeah. be able to close out with discipline, right? Right, right. And and the reason they can't close out with discipline and they're flying by these guys is because they're a step behind on their rotations, right? And so they cannot anticipate. You're, you're playing makeup. Game, right, right. Yeah, exactly. You're making up. So you're trying to make up and compensate because you're so behind on your, your initial rotations that you have to close out. You have to cover so much space in a closeout that you have to close out hard or it's going to be a wide open three in which a team was, is very high from the perimeter tonight, right? And so it it all compounds itself to the things that we see see tonight. And it's just a young team that needs to get better, that has to get better with the, the rotations. And I think they are getting better because we have the flashes, right? We, we see these moments where I was like, wow, that, that was incredible t- team defense, right? But to get back to Jabari, Jabari got switched on to Tyrese Halliburton, right? On switches on an island, right? And... This is where Jabari has been advertised to us as such a valuable player because he's a seven foot, um, he's a seven footer who can move his feet and guard on the perimeter on an island in these situations and be a plus defender. This is one of the major appeals about Jabari Smith, and he was terrible at it against Ty- Tyrese Halliburton tonight. I mean. Biting at the crosses, you know, his his feet, you can you can just see how undisciplined his his feet were. And I'm not saying this is not this is not something that will continue to go on, but you can just tell he's just not there yet on the NBA level, right? He's not, he's not, he 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 he's panicking out there, and we know he's more fluid of a defender than he showed on those uh on those switches. He, he has moments, right, where you see the flashes. You see how good he can be on that side of the ball for sure. We don't want, I, again, I don't want to take anything away from him because he did have easily still his best game of his career despite some of the, the defensive struggles. And the Rockets as a team kind of struggled at points throughout this game. I did like ultimately what Steven Silas did, which was kind of rolling with the lineup that, that started to get them back into this game, similar to the lineup that really started to uh, have a, a positive effect on things to close out the, the first half. Uh, uh, he's he's threw Jay Sean Tate back out there. He went small ball and the Rockets went on what was, I, I believe, a 14 to six run after Alper and Shingoon hit the bench. Uh, I do. I do want to talk a little bit about Alpi's night uh, as well as Jalen Green, kind of his the waves in this game for Jalen, right? Because he had he struggled early, then he was good. Then he kind of struggled again late in the game. Some of the you know, the, the ping ponging back and forth for Jalen Green, as well as our final thoughts and takeaways from this one. We're going to get there in just one moment. But first day's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. We're in the final stretch of the NBA season, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars that's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app it's safe and super easy to use then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores to NBA season awards MVP sixth man of the year defensive player of the year all that stuff including finals odds right now you can take a look at who the NBA finals odds favorites are over at FanDuel Milwaukee Bucks at plus 310 also the Boston Celtics at plus 310 so a two-way tie for the first place betting odds right now the Denver Nuggets plus plus 600. The Phoenix Suns also plus 600, so another tied up spot. And then the Golden State Warriors plus 1300, rounding out the top five. So don't miss a chance to get in on your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with Fanduel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. 
And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, did mention it there a moment ago. Alper and Shingu not playing, you know, in, in overtime in the fourth quarter of this game. The Rockets basically going, you know, with the small ball lineup featuring Jabari Smith Jr. at the five a lot. Um, I, I do think ultimately it was the right move in this game. Um given the fact that you were trying to ride the hot hand or riding with the lineup that kind of fought you back into this game. So I do respect Steven Silas's de- decision there. It wasn't like those Warriors games or the Blazers games where you were getting cooked regardless and you didn't have necessarily a chance to win in either of those games. So you should have Alpi out there so that he can still get the reps, get the practice, whether it's defense, offense, whatever. In this game, though, Alpi really did kind of struggle early on, um, as did the rest of the team. He, he, Really had a lot of issues dealing with Miles Turner. He was getting beat down the floor like every single possession. I, I thought he was better, significantly better in the second half, though. He did finish the game with 14 points on 7 of 11 shooting. But overall, it just the Rockets were a lot more comfortable with the lineups that they had out there with Jabari being featured at the 5, with Us out there for parts of the game, with Jay Sean Tate at the 5 for parts of the game. And it just kind of worked out a little bit better in this one. So I'm not super upset with the decision to hold Alpi out of this one. But... Let's go to Jalen Green here, Madison, because Jalen had what was a very, like, by definition, like an up and down game, right? 24 points, 8 of 23 shooting, was 2 of 7 from long distance, was 6 of 6 at the charity stripe. He had 3 rebounds, 4 assists, a steal, a block, and 4 turnovers, which if memory serves, I believe 3 of them came in the first quarter when he was really bad. Um, At one point when he started this game out, he was 0-4 and had 3 turnovers early on because they were blitzing him on pick and rolls, they were trapping him. And when you're trapping with, you know, Miles Turner and he's got these long arms outstretched over you, if you don't get, if you don't hit the safety valve, if you don't hit the release on getting that ball out of your hands quickly, then you've got two guys crowding you and it's going to be damn near impossible to get rid of that basketball. And we saw that play out repeatedly over and over and over in the first quarter of this game. You could kind of see Jalen was frustrated with himself. He tried driving a few times, couldn't get anything going at the rim against Miles Turner. And then... He woke up a little bit there in the second quarter, you know, going into halftime, finally hit a couple shots, started to get the juices flowing a little bit, was able to get to the free throw line a little bit as well to try and get himself going. I think it's encouraging that he was able to still put together a 20 plus night, a 24 point outing, despite just how off he was from his game, right? Two of seven from long distance, eight of 23 overall. He got swatted multiple times at the rim. And yet at no point did he let that, Like, at no point did he start hanging his head. At no point did he give up in the game. Did he just say, okay, I can't get it done tonight. He wasn't just, like, shoveling the ball to other guys saying, no, your turn, you do it. He just put his head down and tried getting to work. And I think it did, I think it did start to look better in the second half of this game, for sure. Yes, for sure. I mean, I I think that's, you perfectly explained a lot of what what was happening. I mean, they were trapping on these, these dribble handoffs and you could tell that the Pacers had a game plan how on how they would handle um, Jalen Green receiving the ball. Right. And it's a lot of the times that Jalen Green gets the ball off, gets the ball is through these dribble handoff situations and they were told to attack the handoff. They uh, they were very disruptive. T.J. McConnell and Nimhart in in particular, they played Jalen Green very hard up close up in his body. And what he needed to do was in these dribble handoffs was start selling the back cut, right? Start selling it high and hitting the back cut. And he finally did it. I believe it was in the second quarter or third quarter. And he got you know an easy look at the basket and got fouled and got to the line and kind of started getting himself into into some rhythm. He stuck to it throughout the game, even though he was having a shoot a bad shooting night. And he really put a lot of pressure on Turner, even though he wasn't getting the calls. I like that he pre- he continued to go into his body. It wasn't the same. I'm going to try and beat you to the rim that we've seen Jalen Green do throughout the season. It's no, I'm getting into your body and we're going to make the refs make a tough decision. The tough decisions didn't go his way tonight, but honestly, there easily could have been, you know, three more trips to the line off of some of those uh, 50, 50 calls that just they just weren't giving them to Jalen. And I think it honestly came back to help us because they couldn't give Tyrese Halliburton that call against Jabari if they were going to call the game evenly the same way they called it against Jalen, uh, uh, down you know, throughout the game, right? But I, I love how Jalen stuck with it. He found a way to be effective, and I think he should have had about three more assists out of the layups they missed off of, off uh, more good reads, him building on those good reads. I mean, 
I thought it was a really encouraging game for Jalen to be off and still be really effective and find ways to help the team down the stretch. I was disappointed that he didn't get uh, enough shots in that overtime session. I thought that's where Shingun being off the court really hurt us. It was hard for us to get into our sets and run things at when the, it seemed like the Pacers took the defense to a whole nother level. And Knicks was really, really bad in this game. And if there was one gripe I had with Silas, it was allowing Knicks to do what Knicks did in that overtime session. I think he probably took the most shots. He A lot of early shots in the game as well. And the team is just very hard for the team to get Jalen the ball when he's that when he's that focal point. And I think Alper and Shingun helps in, in the middle of the floor get Jalen the ball so we can run the offense that we're, we're trying to run. So that that's my only gripe about it. But I am really proud of how Jalen bounced back from from that type of adversity that he was receiving in the game. A, a big part of that that two man game right between Alpi and Jalen is, is Alpi has commands a lot of the respect from the defense as well to where you, you do see moments where if the game plan is, okay, we're going to trap Jalen on these DHOs regardless of what's happening, then it's up to Jalen to have that quick recognition to get rid of the ball and to be able to you know get it to the next man so that they can make the proper read, whether it's Alpi on the short roll or just get it out to the guy in the corner or, you know, pitch it back to the other guy, you know, on the weak side, whatever it is, he's got to make those quick reads, but Alpi's gravity helps Jalen a lot when they're running that two man game together. And Alpi's just capable, right? He's, he sets hard screens. He knows how to deliver the ball to Jalen. If he cuts one way or fakes one way and cuts back the other way, if his man's overplaying him. So there are some easy opportunities for Jalen that do get generated. I will say Jalen had not one, but two catch and shoot three point opportunities in the first quarter of this game coming off of screens. And I cannot remember the last time we saw Jalen being run off off ball actions like that. It's been a long time. I feel like, and so like opening play of the game for Jalen was him coming off two screens. He like came from the weak side, ran around two screens, came up, was in the, was on the, on the left wing and fired a wide open three pointer. I was like, where has this been all year? Like, I, I was ecstatic for that. And then we saw another one not not too long after that. Unfortunately, he didn't convert on those threes. But those are the types of opportunities where I think just, you know, everything that Jalen does is on ball, on ball centric, you know, downhill pick and roll actions or isolations, transition buckets. Like, I feel like you could give Jalen a little bit of more of a diversified shot diet and it would help him out tremendously as a player just to give him some extra looks, some varied offense where the def- where the defender isn't constantly planted in front of him and it's always, all right, Jalen, go beat your man. All right, Jalen, go beat your man and get a bucket. Jalen, beat your man and go create something for somebody else. Just, you know, allowing him to have some more easy opportunities on the floor. But yes, you know, encouraged by Jalen in this game. The aggressiveness on the drives has been my, probably my favorite development as of late for him. Um, the playmaking has been kind of a, a thing that's been, you know, positive, a positive trend all season long. And so seeing him continue in that regard, and he had, he had a really good dime to like KJ Martin on the roll in this game. Some just really great reads and recognitions where he, and he's got the, he does this, he does it like once a game now, Madison, where he does the the fake look away pass, right? Where he, he, th- he throws the pass and then he looks away like just, Hey, bro, get off. Get off, Jay. Yeah, put that sauce on that thing. I'm with it, bro. Hey, get off, dog. It's, <laughs> it's so, but it's, I, I just, I lose it every time he does it. It's so funny. Like, anyway, so, no, good good overall game from, from Jalen Green. What is kind of maddening here, Madison, is, you know, Dave Nix had a bad game. He did. He just, he had a bad game. Six points, three of 12 shooting. He had three turnovers. He tried to go full Knicks tape in overtime, and it did not work out. Um, It's still mind-boggling to me that the Rockets knew they were going to be without Kevin Porter Jr. in this game, and they still elected to send Ty Ty Washington down to the G League. I I had a peer of mine. I had somebody that I know that covers the Pacers text me going into overtime and said, Dear God, why is... Why is Dacia Nix playing in this game? He is so bad. There can't. Are you telling me there's seriously not a better option? And I immediately texted back and said the better option is currently on assignment in the G League. Like it is so perplexing to me that this is what they deem their best chance to win games. I know that Dacia Nix is a marginally better defender than Ty Ty Washington at this point, but you cannot convince me that Ty Ty would not have been a better option throughout this game. The number of missed layups at the rim for Dacia Nix, the missed three-pointers, the lack of overall ball security, the turnovers, 
This was, again, Dacian had had a few games there where he was looking, where he was trending up, looking a little bit more positive. But then now you get a vintage Dacian Knicks game. And honestly, had he had he been replaced by Ty Ty Washington minutes in this game or even half of, him, half of his time replaced by Ty Ty Washington minutes, I feel like the Rockets may have walked away with a dub in this one, honestly, all things considered. I mean, Clay Torrey Eason. I mean, Tate Any, had been anything. running point guard. Bro, like, you know, Tari had a good defensive second half. You know what I mean? I mean, like, there, there was no excuse for him to play down the stretch the way he did. I mean, Silas, you have to recognize what's going on. He could not get us into our sets. He threw the ball away, did not recognize that Nimhart was breaking on that ball to, to Jalen, yeah. right? And we can give we can give a little bit of that blame to KJ for not setting a good enough screen, but that's what happens when you don't have Alperen Shingun in the game and down the stretch. Offense is harder. They're, the screens aren't, aren't as good, and it's harder to get your best player the ball. And Dacian Nick's, is, Nick's job is to play set, right? It's to orchestrate. It's to get you into effective offense. And he woefully failed at that down the stretch, and he also was really bad on defense, right? And that is my biggest gripe with Silas tonight because I thought Silas coached a really good game, but that, once again, is just mind-boggling. Play Tari. Play him. I, I want to point out, I, I think I had said this in Rockets Watch, but I had called Tyrese Halliburton going off for at least 30 points and 12 dimes. He had 29 points and 19 dimes. It, you had your defensive ace. Dacia Nix was supposed to shut down Tyrese Halliburton. He had 29 and 19 in this game, Madison. Dacia Nix ain't shutting down anybody. It doesn't happen. I need them to get this out of their mind that Dacia Nix is like, a he's yeah, we're going to put Nix on Damian Lillard and shut him down. No, it, it doesn't happen. It doesn't work like, that way. Do want to give some credit here on the way out to KJ Martin. I feel like a broken record saying this, but KJ just quietly does his job and does it so well. Yes, he had some defensive breakdowns in this game. So did the entire team. 23 points, 9 of 13 shooting. Had four boards, had an assist, had a couple steals. Uh, just a really solid all-around game for KJ Martin. And then off the bench, Tari Eason, you gave him his flowers a moment ago, but he had a really good defensive second half. Uh, the Rockets leaning on him heavily in those lineups that were featured that were switching everything where they had all five guys out there and were switching all the actions to try and muck up the offense for the Pacers, which worked. They held the Pacers to just 17 fourth quarter points, which you love to see that. And then they went and gave up 19 in overtime in a five minute stretch because uh, Tyrese Halliburton finally decided he wanted to hit threes again. Um, but, and then Jay Sean Tate, who had like a really weird mixed bag in this game because he was part of the reason that the Rockets were able to come back and be effective in this game because he's such a versatile player on both sides of the court. But I felt really frustrated with how he started this game. He started like over three, Oh three or Oh four from the floor. He had multiple like straight line drives where he didn't even involve a single other player on a possession. Like he just walked the ball up kind of faked like he was going to go one way with a handoff and then just spun around and drove the ball into the paint and like missed shots right at the rim or he got blocked on one of them. I think like that is not Jay Sean Tate is capable of bailing out an offense the same way that like Eric Gordon might've been able to bail you out with like a, you know, just a straight line drive and, you know, body his defender off and get two at the rim. I'm fine with that being the case. If it's like late in the possession and they've run like an action or two and like Jalen can't anything, get anything going or Shingun can't get the post up or Jabari catches the ball on the wing and he needs a bailout. Fine. If Tate catches the ball and he's got 10 seconds left and you need to make something happen. Yes. Drive, get into the paint, go into the land of the trees, do your Jay Sean Tate thing where you spin and pivot and, you know, kiss it off the glass, whatever. That should not be the first or second or probably even third option offensively. And I feel like there's been a bit too much tunnel vision out of Tate as of late, unfortunately. Um, but those are my final thoughts from this one. Madison, you got anything else you want to throw in here at the end before we shut it down? Yeah, I mean, I just would agree. I mean, Tate has to watch that Dylan Brooks in him. He got a little Dylan Brooks in him at times, man, where he just gets it. tunnel vision. And it's just like, hey, hey, bro, like, remember, you know, stay within your lane, dog. Like, we know you have a little bit more juice, but you have to know when to focus it. And I think he, he did it on some uh, fast break opportunities, too, where it's just like it's one on three, bro. Like, you know. Come on, re reset us, right? And and yeah, like the Dacia Nick stuff has to has to stop. I mean, in overtime, he just looked off our uh the our best transition player KJ Martin for a wide open dunk so he could do some crazy layup that he missed. It's just it's just egregious. And I think you know, other than that though, really exciting game, really yeah. fun, competitive game. We got to see a lot. I also like to highlight De uh, Jalen Green's defense. I thought Jalen Green's defense was pretty good, especially down the stretch. He had a play on Tyrese Halliburton where he stripped him. 
excellent defense. And those are the flashes that we we want to see from Jalen because once the game starts to click for him, we'll see that more consistently. Jalen, when he's locked in, is absolutely capable of playing defense. And you know what? I was so pleased by this game, Madison. Even though they took the L, screw it. We're not even running tankathons him. I wanted them to win this game so bad, man. Like, I, they deserved it. They fought back so hard in regulation, and then they just completely sold in OT. Like, it feels so bad. It was almost like, It's almost like it's the perfect tankathon loss, all things considered. But I'm not even going to run a tankathon spin because I they should have won this game. They deserve to win this game. I wanted them to win so that like Jabari would have that confidence moving forward. Jalen would have the confidence that he can still help this team win games even when he's having an off night, whatever. On that note, no tankathon spin on today's episode. Madison, you know the drill. Let everybody know where they can track you down at. Yeah, man. Check me out at, at Madman Leaks, man. Come interact with me on Twitter. That's going to do it for another edition of Locked on Rockets. As always, thank you so much for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcasts. That's Apple, Spotify, Google, the Odyssey app, free and available on all podcast platforms. We're also available on YouTube. Just go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. The comments help a ton. Give me your thoughts on Jabari Smith Jr. in the comments. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Thank you